Mary Frederick Mantle. And today's date is November 28, 1997. Uh, I just decided to take the history of our family because we're having a, an open house on the 27th of December. And if I get it done in time, I could give a tape to each of my sisters. Now, just here's hoping. But I have so much to do where I can't catch up. But I just decided, well, I'm going to sit down and do this. And maybe this will, you know, I could get this done. So I'm going to start with the Cassidy side of the family. That's mother. So we'll start out. Uh, our grandmother was named Ann McCarthy. She was one of 26 children by her father, Jeremiah McCarthy. He had 12 by Ann's mother and 14 by a second wife. He married after his first wife died. Ann's mother was, was Mary Ellen Kettlewell. She married Jeremiah, a convert to the Catholic faith. He was a businessman. He was in trade. They called it business. They called it trade. He owned a weaving mill and also a tavern. During the day, he, his two daughters, Anna and Mary Ellen, and his two sons, Jerry and James, worked in the mill while a man was employed to run the tavern during the day. At night, the mill closed and the father and four children came home to work the tavern. The men serving customers and the girls making sandwiches and some other food for the customers. Well, came the day Jeremiah's wife passed away. I don't know from what or any of that, those details. She left all these children to be raised. The youngest, Elizabeth, was only five years old. There were plenty of older children to manage the home and see that the little young, younger ones went to school. It was only about a year until Jeremiah took a shine to a young girl. Her name was Margaret Morgan and was one year younger than his oldest son, Jerry. Jerry was 24 years old. The girl wanted the girls wanted their father to get married again, but to somebody near his own age. The girls moved to, to a boarding house and continued to work in the mill. Little Elizabeth would come to the mill to see her big sisters, and they'd give her a little change. They told her, this woman in the house is not your mother, and don't you call her mother. They told her to call her Maggie Morgan. Now you know Jeremiah wouldn't stand for that, so he forbid Elizabeth to go to the mill. This part had a happy ending, though, when the girls realized the children really needed a mother, and, uh, and Maggie turned out to be a great one for all Jeremiah's children, as well as her own when they came along. They all did become great friends. Now about our grandmother, Anna McCarthy Cassidy. While Anne lived at the boarding house, she always cleaned the parish church on Saturdays. It must have been the fall, and she was coming home from cleaning the church. It was a little bleak, not dark yet, but bleak. She walked along a path by a big cemetery wall. It ran a whole block. All of a sudden, someone jumped down right in front of her off the wall. She nearly fainted, but the young fellow quickly apologized. You see, all the boys and men would cut through the cemetery rather than walk around the whole block, and they'd jump over the wall. She was so upset, he offered to see her home, and she was only too happy for him to do just that. This fellow was William Cassidy. He was from Ireland, but he came to Sheffield Cutlery to work in England because he didn't want to be a farmer, and that's all he had in, in England was farming. So he came to England for, to get work. Um, he was one of four children, three boys and one girl. The girl was Catherine, and she married a man named Grudy, and they had one child who was Mary Grudy. So many years later, our mother, brides, our mother's bridesmaid in 1912. The boys were school teachers, but William just couldn't find a place in teaching, and neither did he want to be a farmer. This was why he came to England to get into trade. Now, Anne and William saw each other often. Anne was 16, and William was 23. Since both lived in boarding houses, they decided to get married the next year, get a place of their own. William took the English bride home to, to Ireland to live at the old homestead. Didn't know where that was in Ireland. They lived there and had two sons, John and Joseph. Anne wasn't very happy here, but it had to do with it until William could get a home of their own together. Uh, it really wasn't too ambitious. 
Anne was expecting a third child and went home to England to visit her folks in 1886. This is when our mother was born. She was born June 5, 1886. Uh, William still in Sheffield and would go home on weekends or short visits. This was sad for Anne. She felt like a, an outsider, always did more than her share of the chores, along with minding her own children. On one of William's visits, they made plans for Willie to go to America and make a home for all of them. Anna was a thrifty little one and was saving money for the trip for a long while. Didn't have enough for the whole family, but she'll be patient and when Willie had a home for them, then they all give to the United States by hook or by crook. Anne, of course, is back in Ireland with her from her visit to England. She's lighthearted now because she has the dreams to, to live with. William left indeed. April 1887. Of course, Anne was on the way now two months with the fourth child, Helen. She was born October 1887. Um, well, William came home, came here to America, and found a good boarding house to live in, but not too good of a paying job. Anne waited and waited for a letter to say, finally, William has a home for Spring's family too. No such letter, but he was sending a little money home to Anne, which he was saving hard and fast. Willie is already in the United States a year now and no home. Anne now has saved enough money for her passage and her four children. She wrote to her father and told him her plans. Her father knew once she came to the United States, he'd never see her again. He suggested she have the old folks find the children and come home to England. And however many yards of material she could run off the looms in a month she could take with her to the States for dresses later on when she could make for the children. It was the beautiful woolen plaids. She welcomed this idea and did just that. The father had it placed, packed, and, and ready for her when she leave for America. She would be sailing from England, so that was much. there was much to do before that day. She wrote to Willie and told him, get some kind of a home for them because we're coming, ready or not. Aha, uh -huh. I bet that put a fire under him. This was the end of maybe May or, or whatever of 1888. Anne's in-laws were heartbroken for her to leave them because the homestead would be empty without them. She would only leave the two old folks there. Other two sons had their own homes now. The daughter Catherine had, the daughter Kathy, yeah, that's right, had died in childbirth. Mary Drudy was the baby born at that time. Her father raised her for 15 or 16 years, and then he died. Well, anyway, Anne consented to leave her oldest son, John, there with the old couple because he was a good-sized boy of six and very strong. He could do many things on a farm, and besides, he loved the farm and his grandparents. Okay, that's all settled, so now Anne and the other three children set out for England. Joe, strong little guy, everybody liked him, very Irish looking. Our mother was two years old and she had to be she had, had to be carried all the time because she had lost her walk. She used to lean across the cradle and rock Helen and she injured some muscles in her stomach. So along with Helen she had to be carried everywhere. They arrived in England a few, few days before sailing. Her father was well liked and had many friends. He saw to it that the captain and stewards were well paid to take care of his little girl and her babies. This they did. They really earned their pay. Anna was so sick for the whole trip, and these stewards would relieve her of the children many hours in the day. When the final day came for departure, and indeed it was a sad, tearful time, because both sides knew, knew this was final. They would never see each other again. Her father had all the material and many other treats loaded into her cabin for her and the children for while she was so to her and the children for which she was so grateful later she sh shared them with the, she shared the treats with the stewards for their many kindnesses. They adopted Joe and not talk out of him because he was such he had such a thick throat for such a four, such a little boy, he was four years old. 
he assured them that he would grow up and join the Navy, and he was old when he was all grown up. And incidentally, he did join the Navy in 1905. He came out a first-class electrician, married Helen Rooney, and had a daughter, Helen. He passed away in 1926. He died of an ulcer. So to get back to the trip to the New World, can't tell how many days the crossing took. Only know they arrived at Ellis Island, August the 7th, 1888. Anne said everyone was on deck, throwing kisses at the Statue of Liberty and shouting, God bless you, Lady of Liberty. It was very new at this time. I think it was 1886 they put it up. Some people like Anne could only cry because she because she has at last come to paradise as she's going. Other people just knelt on deck and prayed, not looking up at anybody or anything. The stewards had each taken that child up on deck and said this was a sight they should not miss. The steward who was holding our mother had her sitting on the rail and she promptly kicked one shoe into the water. She joked about this later years and says, see, even at two years old I had bum feet. It seemed like fewer, it seemed like forever to be checked out and be handed over to your relatives. It was a big, joyous occasion. William was there, of course, with many friends to greet them. How they got to where they were supposed to stay, I don't know that part, or how long it took them, or any of that. But anyway, Willie didn't have a home set up for them. He took them to the boarding house where he was staying. He had made arrangements with the landlady, very, very kind, motherly type, to, to board the whole family uh, until they got a home. She gave them the whole third floor, no heat up there, so this is where the yards of material came in. Anne made lengths of this to fit each bed by basting stitches. She, she could use the material later for clothing for the children and herself. She could just rip out these stitches. They all had to come downstairs and eat from other, with other four other boarders. The landlady could see Anne was a different class, so she had the men set up boards on horses in the kitchen so the little family could eat alone. They were here for many, maybe month, maybe two or three, I don't know. But Anne took the bull by the horns, and they got a little house together after that. By this time, Anne was expecting twins, 1889. She was so run down, she didn't even have enough for one baby, never mind twins. When they were born, they died immediately. They were William and Anna. Because the old boy thought they had enough children so far, and wanted one name for each of themselves. Here is a little sad note. I forgot to tell you, the day the ship arrived in the United States was the same day John ran down to the fields to tell his grandfather something, a message from his grandmother, and found him dead over the plow. This little boy had to run back and tell the grandmother. He was always a, he was always a very serious child. Now the grandmother is all alone, and of course the plans for John to come to America the following spring just had to be changed. However, by the next year, 1890, the grandmother had died, and Anne sent passage for John and her relative to bring John here to join his family. Mother always said John never really warmed up to his family, because he really, you see, as far as he was concerned, the old folks were his mother and father, and... The farm was his home. He was eight years old when he came here to this country. He was enrolled in St. Francis, uh, St. No, he was enrolled in St. Vincent's school and placed in the first grade. Anne was bitter about this because with two school teacher uncles in Ireland, she felt they should have started his education. They, they never had time for this poor little boy who was so tired doing many of the chores that these two grown-ups should have helped him with. At school, he was seated in a double desk beside a boy named James Broderick. Brother Damien knew James had two very Irish grandmothers living in his house with the family. So therefore, when John would say something the brother didn't understand, James would tell him what John said and vice versa. John told the story many times later that Jim Broderick saved him from many a, a practical joke and many a punch from the bullets. He said Jim could swing a mean fist. Nevertheless, it only took John a month to find his place in
he could take any of them on, and it remained that way into adulthood. John and Tom were mother's favorite brothers. John married Mary Duffy and had eight children. Died when he was 52 years old, worn out. He worked at Baldwin lo locomotives, and the guys used to curse all of Blue Street as a very noisy plant. But anyway, when John would hear J.C. and G. Dead or any other curse with our Lord's name in it, he shouted in capital letters, Praise be the name of Jesus. It got so before they would swear they looked all around to see where John was. True, we only passed this way once, but I'm sure John made an impression on some of these men. They remembered all their lives. After little John arrived to find his place in the Chastity family, Chastity uh, family, more brothers and sisters began to put in an appearance. Tom was next, 1891, mother's very favorite brother. Uh, he was. He always did nice things for Mother. In fact, yeah, when they first got their little home together, Mother and Daddy got together. Uncle Tom scrubbed and painted it from top to top, bottom. It was a kind of favorite uncle. He was a kind of favorite uncle of ours. We had many fun times with his family, especially when he'd come down and pick us up to take us to their house for Sunday dinner. He always brought at least three of his own children for the ride. Our seven, his three, and himself, we had a full car, always wore a hard straw hat. Daddy said he was the only person who could drive a car with his hat down over his eyes because some one of the kids in the back was always bumping it. Um, Uncle Tom married Agnes Kilgallen, and they had 11 children. Uncle Tom also, he died very young, 54 years, in about 1945 or 46, I'm not sure. And Agnes died at 94 years of age in 1986. She was a wonderful lady. We all loved her. She had such a great sense of humor. Gert and I went to her funeral mass, and it was beautiful. The priest knew her, and he, he could tell us all things that happened in years gone by and everything. And can't say we enjoyed it. It was just beautiful to remember her like that. And we all sang um, Oh Danny Boy. That was her favorite song. And we, we all sang that at the Mass. She was a great lady. We all loved her. Well, I'm going to finish this tape now. And I think I'll say, tell you all the children in the Cassidy family. That is the Anna and William it was John, Joseph, Sarah, Helen, Anne and William, Thomas, Mary, Anna, Michael, Bridget, the older Beezy, Elizabeth, and James. And that was your 13 children in that family. So I'll just say Merry Christmas, everybody. I, I hope this is okay. There's, I hear a dog barking in there, and, and the doorbell rang, and... And I got up and answered it every time and stopped the, the, the tape from running it. And when nobody was there, it was after the second time I realized that Jay had just come and he rang the doorbell while I was taping. And this is why the bell was on there. So, uh, and, and I hope they'll like the tape. But, well, I hesitate a little bit. It's because... I'm thinking of something funny. I'm skipping over things, and then I have to put it in order. That's a droning voice. And I was thinking while I was taping it here, Aunt Agnes used to send her children to elocution class. And that's where I should have gone. Now now it's too late to go. But anyway, uh, I was going to edit these later, take out all the mistakes and everything like that. But I can't remember any of the stuff if I do that. So I just decided I'm going to let it go with this. And uh, I'll, maybe sometime later I'd make another old tape. Of, but I just can't get it straightened out because, and you know, Kurt said to me, the way you have to tape it is you go into the bathroom and you close the door. Well, I did that. <laughs> I did that. But
but then you know what happened. I have a, a ventilator in the top, whatever you call that, exhaust fan. So I put it on so I could see what I was doing. And, of course, that was all the tape. Well, that was a bummer. I'd be allowed to tell her that. Well, anyway, I, I'm going to let this go with this. But I, I was thinking also, now, anybody who hears this tape and they say, oh, no, that wasn't right. No, I remember this. Go ahead if you remember all these things. It's just like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all had their own versions of the gospel. So now, if, if somebody wasn't born in 1700 or whatever, you put that in your own, own whatever, biography. So, and I was going to, I don't know how much tape is left on here, but I was going to tell a story about John T. I think I'll try to tell it anyway. Um, well, they lived in Ireland, John T., and he had three sisters. It was uh, Julia and Sarah and Mary. And then when their parents died, they left the four of them over there. So Anne Anne and Uncle William were in this country with all their own children. So they decided that they would bring these four orphans to this country, but they were bigger. I think Julie was only maybe six or something. She was still in school. But the others were big enough, old enough to work. So they came here. And uh, so, of course, you had to sponsor them in those days. So that was okay, because Grandpa had them sponsored. He he went down to Dave McMahon. He was a politician in those days, and anything you wanted, you went to him. You know, I guess you, you greased his palm with a little bit of green stuff. But anyway, um, yes, they were assured that when they landed in the country, there'd be a job for John. So they came. Now comes, they're all settled and everything. So John... The grandpa says to him, all right, now go down. You're going to go down and see Dave McMahon. He has a job for you. So he said, and he says, take your working clothes with you. So John said, all right. Anyway, down he went. He gave him directions. And down he went. And he arrived on the job. And he says, I'm William Cassidy's nephew. And he sent me down. He says, you have a job for me. Oh, indeed, you're a fine-looking boy. You know, he says, did you bring your working clothes? And he says, these are my working clothes. There's this Sunday suit and a white shirt and tie, shiny shoes. Oh, no, says Dave McMahon, you can't work in those clothes. He says, he says, I have a tinsmithy's job ready for you. He says, you can't work in those clothes. Oh, no, he says, I, I don't want a tinsmithy's job, he said. He says, that's not the kind of work I'm looking for. Well, says Dave, well, then that, that's all I have right now. So John said, thank you very much. And he left. Well, now it comes supper time, and, and John isn't back home, and Anne Anne is worried, sick. where could he be in this strange country and everything? So anyway, they're all sitting down at the table, and, and in those days, he didn't put out a, a whole points bullet, you know, my, my nephew's lost. They waited. So anyway, they're eating their dinner, and Annie he came, hello, folks, you know. And uh, where have you been? Well, he says, I got myself a job. So Grandpa, of course, he says, of course you did. He says, Dave McMahon had it for you. No, 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 Dave McMahon, he said. He said, I, he had a tinsmithy's job for me, and I have no parts of that, he said. So he says, I just roamed around a little bit, and I asked some questions, and I went to the Reading Railroad, he said. And I asked them, you know, if any, there was any job open, and they said the only job open was a timekeeper, and if I could do that, you know, they'd take me on. So he said, I, I said, I would try. So he says, I start work tomorrow morning. Well, this was funny because, and I think that was the only job he had all his life. He worked for the railroad. But he had such confidence in himself, and he was a handsome guy, too, you know. Because all those Irish guys are handsome. And they lived with Grandma for just a little bit, you know. And when he got this job, of course, he was making millions, you know, according to them. But it was enough that they could get a little house together. And then Sally and Mary got a job in the old cotton toilet. And the, the older girls got a job there. Started Their first job would be there. So in no time, they got a little house together for the four of them. And they, got, they managed to send Julie to school. And everything was fine. So they were a little house, a little unit of all their own. So I just thought I'd put that in because... Mother used to tell me that, and the confidence he had that to, a brand new in this country, and then he goes out and runs the city. city. So uh, I guess the tape didn't didn't run out yet. So I'll 
Goodbye. Goodbye for everybody. God bless you.